Welcome to the online lecture by Jean Monnet Chair at Rigo Grade School of Law on the issues relating the power of balance in EU institutions. Today, we will focus on two institutions on the EU Council and European Council and see how the shift in institutional balance since Lisbon Treaty entered into force has influenced the decision-making, but also output of the union in terms of its political commitment. To start with, I would like to engage in discussion with you on the topic of how the treaty adoption 2009, Lisbon Treaty, has changed also the setup of institutions and institutional decision making. Before Lisbon Treaty, the Maastricht Treaty has established three pillar system. First pillar on internal market, community, the second pillar on common and foreign security policy, and then finally, the justice and home affairs pillar that has still been very intergovernmental during the previous treaties. So whereas the internal market decisions have been on community method level, then uh, the discussions on foreign policy and um, internal issues or migration or justice affairs have been uh, intergovernmental within a Treaty of Nice and Treaty of Maastricht. With the adoption of Lisbon Treaty 2009, the uh, pillar system has been abolished. And the consequence was that now uh, two amended treaties are in force. Uh, the one, the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, uh, under which we have issues on uh, decided by community method. And here we find the previous uh, first pillar issues, uh, the internal market issues, but also uh, the new um, um, area of freedom, security and justice that is uh, the former Justice and Home Affairs third pillar now integrated rather under community method. That means that the matters, decisions on Justice and Home Affairs have become more supranational. But issues like foreign policy and uh, European defense policy still is uh, very much intergovernmentally decided. So meaning that member states play the most important role here and the institutions, uh, supranational institutions like the Commission and the European Parliament are engaged, uh, but they are uh, not leading the process here. So with this in mind, uh, I would like now to start the discussion about the changes of power of balance, because already this slide indicates that there is a change towards more uh, supranational uh, decision making. And the question is then the fact that European Council has been with the Lisbon Treaty promoted as official institution. It has uh, also impact on balancing uh, the, um, the institutional setup rather to community method by replacing then the community uh, method um, in, in uh, for example, European Council uh, decisions uh, to still preserving intergovernmental uh, mode of decisions. Here we come to um, overall structure of uh, EU institutions in their interaction. Um, in previous online lectures, we have addressed issues on the Commission, on the uh, European Parliament and on uh, legitimacy of the EU. Uh, but here we have all uh, in one place um, to indicate that 
the supranational institution, the commission and its president and commissioners, uh, and directly, uh, directly, uh, directly um, elected European Parliament uh, here uh, on one side, and then we have Council and European Council that act uh, in intergovernmental mode um, with a lot of member states' interests in place, both on um, ministers' level, but also on political level in terms of heads of states uh, meeting at European Council. So one by one, how uh, the member states then balance the supranational nature of institutional setup. First, through their participation in, in the Council of the EU. So Institution Council consists of uh, 27 member states um, and uh, most common at uh, the ministerial meeting, EU Council ministerial meeting, um, conveys 27 member states, uh, ministers, and the, uh, and, the, and the work is carried out under the EU coordination uh, in terms of six months rotating presidency. So here, the presidency comes from a member state. It's one of the member states rotating as a presidency, and the decision is, is made among 27 member states. And once they agree, then the um, this agreement becomes uh, a uh, council um, agreed position that is then uh, respectively um, a pass to, uh, for example, European Parliament for co-legislation um, or um, interacting with the Commission in, for example, implementing decisions, including in external relations. And then um, another format where 27 member states are heard and when they have a, a possibility to express their national interest and vote uh, by unanimity by pre preserving their national interest with veto right, rights is European Council heads of states format. And this uh, meeting is chaired by the European Council president. So we will now, uh, in continued slides, uh, go into details with each of these formats to see how the change um, also in decision making and their powers in the treaties have uh, uh, shifted the power. Um, and my conclusion um, is that the European Council has definitely gained a lot of power uh, during recent years as a highest decision-making body uh, deciding on political issues um, and also external crises. But here we have another actor that actually again balances the power. And this is after Lisbon Treaty has been uh, adopted, high representative, vice president of the commission. And uh, the high representative po uh, position uh, was created in order to and uh, ensure continuity in foreign policy and not to allow presidency every six months to change the focus of foreign policy and defense policy. So uh, the high representative is chairing uh, one of the council, the uh, Foreign Affairs Council, but also together with member states, leads the work of formulation of the member states uh, and EU position. So it is not the foreign policy uh, defined by high representative, but it is foreign policy defined by member states under leadership of uh, high representative. And uh, high representative in this work is supported by European External Action Service. So uh, let's then get started. The lecture is focusing on the differences in power balance between uh, all institutions, but with focus on uh, the EU Council and the European Council. So what is uh, these institutions have in common and what are the differences? For the first, these are two 
separate institutions because the treaty, Article 13, has defined all the institutions of the EU uh, and after 2009, European Council has been um, um, specifically uh, pointed out as a separate institution of the EU. Commonalities first. So what is common? Uh, what the common uh, uh, the, the common character of uh, both institutions is the representation. So by whom, whose interests are represented through these institutions? And the um, both cases, it is interest of uh, member states. So 27 interests, 27 governments, and uh, both in the um, Council of European um, Union and uh, the European Council, uh, the national interests are in focus. The differences are that the um, European Council acts on uh, the level of heads of state, so the uh, prime ministers, in some cases presidents, participating, and the European Council, as we will see later in the slides, is actually dealing with, on a much higher level, with the European politics in uh, terms of its planning, um, of its crisis management, uh, setting the course, and, and also encouraging, for example, other um, institutions to act. So um, European Council can call for action and uh, uh, encourage the Commission to come up with the uh, legislative proposal, pro proposal where necessary. Uh, but also European Council deals with internal issues, internal market issues, digital market, internal market, uh, the financial stability through the uh, European semester process and so on. So European Council has become very prominent um, by uh, presenting uh, the government's interests, but also caring about, from government's perspective, what EU should deal with. Um, uh, so Put, uh, putting actually the future agenda of the EU. Um, and um, in other words, we call it leaders agenda. So union member state leaders unite and, and agree upon some directions where the union should um, be heading. Um, so now to the Council. EU Council is the again um, is, a, is is representing member state governments, but on a minister level. And in order to uh, agree on in during ministerial meetings um, on legislative acts, from difference to the European Council here, we are adopting legislative acts regulations and the um, directives and others. Uh, this work is done on several um, levels, starting with civil servants, then uh, a level of ambassadors, and then going to ministers. Uh, we go into details about this, but here we have been setting the stage. What are these institutions uh, doing uh, and what are the uh, dif differences uh, between their mandate um, as set in the treaties. So then let's start to look closer into the Council of the European Union. Uh, the place where the Council meets is in Brussels on um, uh, Schulman Platz. There is a Council building and uh, the participates, participants of the council meetings are the member state delegates. And uh, either they are uh, um, already resident in Brussels and, and uh, attending meetings from permanent representations in Brussels, or they arrive from respective member states' capitals to uh, the meetings. 
the council is dealing with the uh, uh, legislative work and council has first to agree internally uh, among member states on the uh, proposed text by the commission so that means that during the negotiation process and it can be one like during a year or even more um, the negotiation process will be restricted so these documents are not public they are distributed through the extranet channels to the member states delegates including also that <clears throat> Entrance uh, to the building is restricted to participants only. So the negotiation process is not open for media, not open for lobbyists or NGOs uh, or civil society. So this is a member state driven uh, process with engaging uh, with the council secretariat, but also uh, with the commission present. So commission has no uh, voting rights, but commission is always present as a legislator, uh, as, a, 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 as an issue, initiator of a legislative act. And uh, the meetings of the Council of the EU are chaired by the Council Presidency, except after Lisbon Treaty, where the Foreign Affairs Council is chaired by the High Representative, Vice President of uh, the Commission. So this is how it works. The Commission comes up with the proposal because Commission has a, a, a monopoly on a, a, a proposal uh, for for a legal act, and the. Once the Commission has uh, published the um, the uh, proposal for legislative act, it is then transferred to two legislators. Uh, so legislation in the EU is carried out jointly by the Council of the European Union and the Parliament, European Parliament. And today our interest is focused more on council. So council, 27 member states jointly uh, would be one of legislators. So there are two parallel processes uh, of negotiations. One is negotiations inside council to agree on the council, um, internally on the council's position regarding comm commission's proposal. And then, uh, the next step would be interacting with the European Parliament that also during the time would have come forward with uh, amendments. And then uh, the Council and European Parliament interaction starts uh, and uh, may be concluded in first reading, second reading, or in some cases even in cancellation committee in third reading. Uh, so once the legal act is adopted and published in official journal, then uh, this becomes an EU law and the Commission then is monitoring how the EU law is transposed into the national legislation of the member states. And in some cases, when uh, the member states fail to do so, uh, then there could be a case uh, uh, for European Court of Justice. So every uh, legislative act is adopted by um, so council being one of the legislators uh, have to formally uh, by ministers to vote uh, for uh, the um, the document and um, the uh, process may continue because it will include several levels, the working groups, uh, the um, ambassadors, corporate ambassadors and ministers. But once it comes to the ministers, it is important that the uh, dossiers are handled within one of the council formations. So together, a council is working as one institution, but in several um, thematic configurations. It could also remind work of government because we have one government, but several ministries. So here, the uh, work of um, some dossiers um, are handled in uh, only by one minister, kind of minister of environment would be always responsible for 
uh, legal acts, uh, European uh, directives and regulations on environment, on international environment and climate. But if we have, for example, uh, the Council of Justice and Home Affairs, we have two ministers. We have Minister of Interior and Minister of Justice. Uh, and in competitiveness issues, we may even have three ministers because they can be consumer um, interests and then there can be economy interests and competition interests and also financing interests. Um, and so this is the set of um, all council formations uh, through which legal um, work is done and uh, that deal with legislation process. So when presidency takes uh, six months chairing of the EU presidency, then nine of these councils must be covered by the rotating presidency ministers but only one council has a permanent uh, chair of the meetings and it is Foreign Affairs Council uh, that was already previously explained that because of con um, uh, continuity of uh, the foreign policy and um, uh, the uh, Lisbon Treaty has assigned a role of high representative vice president of the commission to lead the process uh, uh, in um, agreeing on foreign policy. And foreign policy is also not neither exclusive nor shared competence, it's a competence of its own. Uh, and there are many exceptions uh, that are um, discussed in other online lectures um, under this project. So council once passing issues uh, through the ministerial meetings, can also um, shift between the, uh, the thematic um, um, council configurations. For example, if the dossier is already agreed on uh, um, level of working parties and uh, ambassadors, corporate ambassadors, and there are no outstanding uh, issues for discussion for ministers, so this becomes so-called A point. And as A point, it can be passed through any council. So it may happen that because council is one institution, that foreign ministers in A point um, uh, agenda um, group uh, would pass something about agriculture uh, without being experts on agriculture. But this is just a formal rubber stamping of the dossier on the ministerial level. So uh, this means that the uh, ministers of the respective council will only deal with the uh, remaining um, negotiations that were not done uh, on lower levels. And to explain this work, uh, please follow this slide. Uh, so as explained, the A items or A issues um, can be reached already among experts and ambassadors uh, at quarter per meetings, uh, but only remaining issues for ministers and, and from all um, uh, legislative acts is about 20, more than 20% that are decided and, uh, and, and discussed among the respective ministers. So council work is kind of iceberg that we see the ministerial work on the top but the whole council work is, is carried out on the level of member states, uh, experts and, and ambassadors interacting on each single dossier that is presented by the commission. Uh, now, some words about the uh, working groups. Uh, there are about 150 different working groups, and they are uh, related to the different themes and uh, and different scope of discussion. And there can be, for example, for environment, there can be a working group on environment that applies to EU internally, so directive that would harmonize the rules inside EU. But then there is another uh, working group that deals with environment uh, globally, where European Union is an actor 
with regard to global partners. And then in this working group, Union will agree on its action uh, towards uh, global uh, targets or conventions. Now, getting to another institution where the member states are represented through the government, but on the highest level of government heads of states. So European Council is uh, the, uh, the highest decision-making body and the treaties, the founding treaties did not decide on the European Council as an institution. It all actually started uh, by um, some of the member founding member states questioning the two supranational way of decision making in the community. So uh, specifically, the first questions were raised by France that France was a bit hesitant about the high authority of that time, the Commission. Uh, taking too much leadership in agreeing on deciding on issues that became binding for France. So the European Council was established as a consequence of uh, French President de Gaulle's idea that uh, there is a necessity of uh, heads of states or uh, member states at that time, founding member uh, states, uh, um, heads of states and leaders, uh, also to make their voice heard. And by doing so, they also questioned uh, the uh, that time uh, the, uh, the the commission uh, general interest only leadership. Uh, because the member states at that time also wanted to uh, put forward a more intergovernmental mode of decision making um, and not only rely on supranational institutions um, showing uh, the, the, the route. So uh, the first idea um, in 1960s already, uh, but the uh, as first European Council meeting took place in the 70s, in 1974. And uh, in the beginning, it was not a treaty structure. It was rather a conference of heads of states coming together to balance a bit of supranational uh, institutions, uh, leaderships. And here, the uh, the council meeting coming uh, together step by step started to establish this as a habit. And uh, with the treaty in a single European Act, uh, and later with the Maastricht Treaty, European uh, Council already became uh, a format of the heads of states uh, leadership, balancing the na na national interests in the decision-making uh, process. Only with the Treaty of Functioning of European Union, it became a formal institution. And um, since then, since 2009, uh, when we have European Council as a formal institution, its role and prominence has only increased. Um, I will start here with saying that uh, in the treaty, the, um, the treaty is actually envisaging that the European Council should meet um, uh, four times a year for summits that always will be held in Brussels a year formal summits uh, in Brussels. And um, uh, which mean that two uh, heads of states meeting per presidency. In reality, the European Council has met either in person or now even online much 
more often. And during the period of Brexit and uh, to dis decide on uh, steps while EU, while Brit Britain was withdrawing from the EU and also on the uh, next steps on a new engagement uh, following the Brexit of the UK into the EU. So the uh, summits were held um, even more often. And uh, so what then is uh, the, uh, the main objective of this institution? What, what are they, what is the output? It needs to be pointed out that the European Council is not a legislative format. It is not carrying out legislative functions. Um, that is left for the Council of the EU. But the European Council is, um, in exceptional cases, uh, performing uh, the um, decision on so-called last resort. In case that the ministers cannot agree, this issue can be lifted up uh, to the European Council meeting. It's possibly not the best practice because uh, the politicians on the level of um, heads of state also have veto rights. And uh, uh, then it may be sometimes even more difficult uh, to, to agree if uh, there are substantial differences of opinion between the member states on the specific um, legislation. Uh, but the agreement between the heads of states is highly political. So they adopt council conclusions. So it's a politically binding te text. And uh, the council conclusions would deal with uh, uh, future uh, policy planning leaders agenda, as explained before. It may um, it deal with um, response to global crisis or external conflicts. Um, it may agree on uh, uh, taxation, on budget, uh, on enlargement, on um, sanctions. So highly sensitive issues um, that are also uh, crucial for um, putting EU on a level of a global actor. So this must be then agreed among heads of state because it has the consequences of EU's global actorness. All the treaty changes are adopted by heads of state. Consequently, the treaty changes are adopted by unanimity. And it is also one of the reasons why the heads of state uh, why, why it takes so long time uh, to change the treaties. The recent treaty uh, was open before it was adopted 2009. Uh, in December, was open uh, almost for eight years because it went to the referendums and then came back. And then there was, uh, um, from constitution, uh, the consequence was that the Lisbon Treaty was, um, was reframed and then uh, only what was um, the, the the heads of state uh, where where the the consensus was possible uh, could be agreed. The European Council also plays an in very important role as an initiator of new processes in uh, in the decision making. So here uh, the um, idea about the new legislation or new initiatives may come from citizens' uh, initiatives, it may come from the Commission, it may even come from the political initiative from the Parliament, but it is European Council that invites uh, the Commission to draft the legal proposal. And after that, uh, the process starts step by step first by opening up to consultations in, in order to get input from civil society, interest groups, um, business organizations, and so on. But then the commission drafts a proposal. This is then voted by the College of the Commissioners. 
And once it is ready and put forward for legislators, then Council and the European Parliament come into play and the legislation process would maybe take another two to four years. So to create a new legal act in total can take many years, as you see here, like five years, but it doesn't um, say that no fast track decisions are possible. So sometimes EU needs to decide rapidly uh, in order to react on external conflict or to decide on highly political initiatives immediately. So the work of the European Council is chaired by the president. It is a position that was created also by Lisbon Treaty. And this permanent president uh, that is uh, appointed for two and a half years uh, uh, has and possibly to be prolonged for two and a half years, has his um, or her responsibility to uh, lead the European Council work, uh, to prepare it, uh, to interact with the parties in ensuring consensus, and actually to drive the decision-making work forward, to make it possible that agreement is there uh, by the morning, of the um, uh, before the heads of state leave uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, there is also accountability in front of the European Parliament because uh, the president interacts with the European Parliament, presenting after each European meeting what has been discussed. But also European Council president has external representation and the challenges with external representation vis-a-vis uh, -vis other positions is discussed in another online lecture. Um, we will get there a bit later, also speaking about high positions. But here, uh, I want to start the uh, discussion about power balance. So to what extent uh, one institution is more powerful uh, with respect to others? And the definitely the overall um, uh, objective of uh, the institutions is to to um, keep uh, uh, the the balance between uh, the institutions very stable because uh, the Commission is representing uh, general interests, uh, Parliament is representing political interests, and uh, Council and European Council is representing uh, member states' national interests. So to make European Union work uh, efficiently, um, uh, to keep capacity to decide and to make Europe more present in global issues, the Treaty of uh, Functioning of European Union introduced uh, several innovations. And the one uh, that is definitely affecting the powers of uh, the EU Council and the European Council is the planning or so-called agenda setting. And as said, there's always a challenge where there are more than one chefs in the kitchen. And this is the case with definitely with the agenda setting uh, in the European Union because commission is entitled by the European Treaty to uh, plan and to set agenda, both annual agenda and long-term agenda. So commission is elected for five years. So the commission president in 2024 would envisage five years vision agenda for uh, the new commission. In order to balance this and not allow supranational power to decide only, the member states, uh, heads of states also, so the first uh, also come up with the uh, European Council political guidelines, so called leaders agenda. And of course, it is very important that the leaders agenda is also coherent with the commission's agenda because it is all about the European Union. 
And in treaty, also European Union has a single legal personality. So looking from outside to Europe, it should be very confusing if the Commission would come up with other priorities than European Council uh, heads of state. Uh, but at least there is an inbuilt, um, even like competition between uh, institutions uh, to uh, drive forward the uh, interest. Uh, so the next chef in the question uh, in the kitchen is uh, uh, presidency, because also presidency comes up uh, with um, six months. Uh, planning uh, and priorities for their own presidency. But then in cooperation with previous and next presidency, there's also three year presidency program. So in uh, uh, spanning a, a, across 18 months, there will be also planning by the EU Council presidencies. So we have the commission planning, the European Council vision, and the uh, presidency priorities that need to be coherent. So planning for the commission as explained, I support uh, uh, here by the uh, article because article 17 is expecting from the commission. The commission will come up with annual and multi-annual programming. And this is done through um, uh, the uh, every year commissioner, commission president is uh, delivering State of Union speech in September. And this is the best way to, fo uh, to follow uh, annual planning of the commission because also this um, uh, reflects the priorities and the ranking of the priorities of the commission in uh, during uh, the current year. The uh, commission also shall publish uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this document as a general report uh, between, be, be, before the opening of uh, the European uh, Parliament. So we have articles in the treaty that are uh, specifically uh, outlining uh, the uh, responsibilities of the Commission in the planning process. But also the same applies to Council. So the Article 15 um, is uh, specifically uh, also pointing out the Council's role, European Council's roy, role, uh, by um, encouraging the uh, European Council to provide Union with necessary impetus for its development and to define the general political directions. So this is um, also uh, in the direction of um, leaders' agenda, but not in exercising legislative fun functions, but rather in uh, setting political course. And as explained, the presidency puts forward the trio presidency uh, program um, that after 2009 has become less uh, um, ambitious uh, or even leaving it to high representative uh, to deal with external relations and uh, defense policy because it is no longer prerogative of the rotating presidency. So to some extent, presidency is not even allowed uh, to intervene. And in cases presidency wants to, um, to be ambitious in external uh, relations field, uh, then in close cooperation uh, with a high uh, representative. Um, we have another um, lecture, online lecture, about the role of the EU presidency, uh, but uh, the presidency should not uh, overestimate its uh, role because it's not the presidency of the European Union, but it is the presidency of council. So council presidency, meaning that um, here the article is explaining that uh, the main task of the presidency is to 
organize and carry out smooth operation of council's work, uh, assisted by the General Secretariat and Legal Service of the Council, um, and to set up uh, the also a, a program, uh, but it is limited to six months um, during uh, which the presidency has a, a leading uh, role in chairing the ministerial meetings. So here we come uh, to the explained challenges in uh, power balance between institutions. And these challenges already uh, built in a treaty, um, how the treaty is dealing with uh, uh, the uh, positioning or length of uh, a mandate of different portfolios. So we have, um, the president of the commission, five years term, that is appointed and elected by European Parliament, uh, appointed by governments, um, voted by QMV, by European Council, and elected by the European Parliament, and sits for five years. So the commission term will end 2024. And at the same time, when the Commission President takes office, also High Representative Vice President of the Commission um, is appointed and elected. Um, so uh, later we have also the President of the European Council with, um, uh, after Lisbon Treaty becoming a permanent uh, figure uh, and sitting uh, consecutive for two per terms, uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, with just a decision by European Council to be elected for further prolonged term. And then we have also uh, the prime ministers and foreign ministers of the member states that previously, before Lisbon Treaty entered into force, were very visible through the rotating presidency, currently being less visible because neither prime minister is uh, entitled uh, to lead European Council, nor foreign minister is entitled to lead the Foreign Affairs Council that is done by these uh, permanent uh, positions. So the, the balance has shifted uh, more towards uh, the institutionalization of the union, um, but uh, at the same time, uh, it explains also why the prominence of European Council is so visible, because uh, while not being able to exercise their full influence as prime ministers uh, on nation state level as presidency, there, there it is reflected now in uh, more power to the European Council as an institution. Um, and here um, uh, also some balancing uh, how uh, the uh, commission uh, president is uh, appointed. So the European Council has to agree by qualified majority voting, uh, though in many cases it is done um, by consensus because it is very difficult to imagine and commission presidents in power who is not supported by all the heads of state in this um, mandate. But then the proposed candidate is elected by the European Parliament. So the power of the European Parliament here is uh, very clear because the European Parliament says the last word. On um, capacity to decide, so, um, one of the objectives of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union was uh, to make Union um, capable in carrying our decision. And, and here we have to, uh, to see what, what else has changed in a treaty uh, to reach this, um, this objective. Uh, so we see that um, with the Lisbon Treaty, uh, we have uh, three groups of competences, exclusive competence, shared competence, and uh, um, coordinated comp competence, and that uh, more and more competences are shifting towards exclusive competence of the Union. So before Britain um, uh, withdrew uh, its membership, there was even um, by British Parliament initiated process of 
reviewing of the EU competencies, just to check whether this is a sign of some kind of creeping integration, that competencies are even more and more with time shifting to the EU level. Uh, the other um, change uh, that encourages cap capacity to decide, but the question is whether um, it is also challenging the member states' national interests, is that voting rules are shifting more to qualified majority voting. So member states are more and more losing power of uh, veto, um, which ensures that there is uh, efficiency in decision-making, but the question uh, remains, uh, what about uh, national interest at stake? And uh, currently the open discussion about uh, applying qualified majority voting further in future also to foreign policy issues is very much contested. Uh, so this is an open question. Uh, see what will happen in future uh, with changing uh, voting rules towards more uh, qualified majority voting that, for example, Justice and Home Affairs has already with this treaty um, and, and um, uh, issues that were more uh, sensitive have been already shifted to QMV uh, currently. The changes in council formations mean that uh, we have the high representative who has now taken the role of uh, chairing the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, and that has directly affected the council presidencies. role. So presidency has lost power um, in external relations, uh, but the um, power has been more concentrated in hands in a permanent body high representative with the European Ex External Action Service. Um, Partly, I have already discussed uh, these issues about external action service uh, that is supporting um, high representative in carrying out his or her uh, responsibilities. Uh, since the EU is having single uh, personality, also the commission delegations were replaced by EU delegations. So EU is speaking with one voice, but that is actually bringing together several institutions, no longer commission alone, but now also uh, the uh, the council voice, um, high representative uh, who leads the work of the Foreign Affairs Council also brings this output to the implementation globally. And uh, also um, International prominence mean that Article 42 has now included the solidarity clause that um, means that EU uh, internally um, carries solidarity with respect to other member states, but also external global solidarity. Uh, there is an online lecture on EU as a global external actor, so I will not stay longer with question, is EU a global leader? But speaking about European Council role, definitely this is there, that European Union is um, agreeing on its global action. So, my conclusions, one by one. Um, the fact that since 2009 uh, and adoption of Lisbon Treaty, the European Council has become a formal institution, has increased its power. So the power shift goes in favor of the European Council. Also, with establishing a permanent a president for the leading of work of the European Council has strengthened the European Council role, ability to decide, ability to be represented externally, and also uh, a continuity of decisions with respect also leaders' agenda and setting the political course aside 
uh, with the political goals of the Commission. A uh, high, highly high representative um, is also vice president of the Commission. And therefore, my conclusion here is that because of double hatted position of high representative, uh, the Commission is also playing quite a strong role in external relations. And uh, this is also seen in the functioning of the EU delegations abroad, uh, so that uh, to some extent the Commission uh, um, employees are accountable to the uh, to the Commission uh, service in in Brussels. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is also ensuring the efficiency and continuity of the external relations, because now we have a much larger resource by including also commissioners of external relations in carrying out external relations policy. The fact that high representative is taking a lead of, Europe, uh, uh, of uh, Council, of Foreign Affairs Council, is definitely uh, strengthening the Council's role. Uh, the fact that more co-decision is in place uh, with the European Parliament um, is, uh, well, it is a balancing act, but uh, the Council always needs to, um, to align um, internally uh, to keep uh, also the uh, decision under the leadership of the presidency, uh, the, the position very clear, uh, in order not to give in if uh, the, their views with the European Parliament would contradict. So this means that um, uh, in order to maintain uh, the clear position, sometimes the Council is going for the presidencies, uh, they just can't agree, and then they are going for next reading in the Parliament for second or third reading. Um, and finally, uh, more rights of initiative are given to the Commission, uh, which explains that uh, member states and council voice uh, possibly is less uh, in place, except foreign affairs and issues relating to uh, European defence, where the member states are still in front seat in driving the policy uh, initiatives forward. And then um, finally, my final conclusion about the um, what is left for member state national interests. So if we see the conclusion from member states perspective, uh, so with a permanent president in the European Council, the member state prime minister is less visible because uh, the presidency's country is no longer in charge of European Council meetings. Um, also, member states are um, have to count on high representatives role uh, and presidency alone cannot carry out uh, priorities during its presidency, but uh, definitely need to cooperate closely or even under uh, the uh, high representative instructions. Uh, which leads me to the next point that it is uh, less influence of the uh, presidency on external relations. Uh, because of uh, more decisions made by qualified majority voting, uh, the member states influence uh, or the member states ability to keep the national interests intact um, is also under question because more and more issues are just decided by 73% of agreement of the member states. And what if uh, a, a member state has a very important national uh, interest concern and is, is, is left in, in minority? Uh, because of European uh, Parliament uh, being more and more powerful, I would also claim here uh, that uh, 
member states really need to uh, put forward uh, their interests in um, in the uh, co-legislative work with the uh, European Parliament and work very efficiently in finding an efficient outcome of uh, the Council so that it can then further through the presidency be um, handled uh, with the European Parliament as a co-legislator. Um, and finally, uh, the treaty has uh, brought more and more supranational powers uh, in place, more um, supranational decision-making um, that has uh, resulted in, in um, actually questioning intergovernmental tendencies in decision-making. And once there are inter intergovernmental uh, negotiations, then also uh, the large member states uh, being um, more prominent in voicing uh, their um, uh, initiatives. Uh, yet important to note that all decisions and European Council meetings are decided by unanimity. So both large and small states have the same power of their vote. And uh, my final um, conclusion, since the Council and European Council are uh, uh, consisting of the uh, member states and uh, national interests, so there are double challenges. We have, we are facing one challenge with the uh, Union becoming more and more supranational, more and more community method driven. Um, on the other side, that the um, small member states are exposed uh, uh, for challenges that relate to uh, the dominance of, of large member states. But this is something uh, to be addressed um, again in, in future uh, treaty changes, if such will appear. Uh, my overall um, conclusion is that uh, no matter what the interests are and what interests are represented, they need to be balanced. So there is place for general interest, there is place for people's interest, there are, is place for national interest. So all these institutional interests uh, need to um, act in balance. So only then uh, the uh, European Union uh, will be able to act efficiently uh, in a democratic manner and also as a global actor. Thank you.